So this was a uh, this was a big report. This is the World Meteorological Organization, and of course they did highlight and headline the absolutely phenomenal 2023 global warming temperature increase. And it really is phenomenal. I mean, Gavin Smith, the uh, director of uh, NASA GISS, he wrote a little letter to a Nature Journal saying that um, it's beyond anything that the scientists can explain right now. and welcome to another Climate Emergency Forum. My name is Regina, and I'm your host as we discuss this red alert, planet in peril. We're going to be reporting today on the most recent report from the World Meteorological Organization. There's a lot to say, unlike so many other reports out there, unlike some of the climate scientists who say that we have plenty of time to get our act together, the W. MO has issued a red alert. Every single indicator in 2023 was broken. Every single indicator that lets us know that we are in deep trouble. So the information that we have for the most recent year has indicated that once again, we have hit the warmest year on record. We have reached 1.45 Celsius above pre-industrial averages. That has an error of plus or minus 0.12 degrees Celsius, which essentially puts us over the 1.5 that so many climate activists and climate scientists have urged us to keep alive. That dream has died, and we knew that it would. We had... Dr. James Hansen sounding the clarion call. And we have been sounding the clarion call that 1.5 is dead in the water and only alive in terms of people's fantasies and what we wish to have happen. We have had tremendous heat waves, floods, droughts, wildfires, you name it, intensening cyclones. Every part of this planet has seen some type of destruction. One of the things that really, really is disturbing to me is the overwhelming warming of the oceans. So for all records since 1971, much like Michael Mann's hockey stick, it has just gone up like this and then shot up into the stratosphere. So, you know, the living beings on this planet evolved over millions of years to live in certain environments Living beings are no different from Homo sapiens. We are extremely adjustable. We live in every part of the planet, but there are living beings who need a certain higher range and lower range of temperature in order to survive, in order to hunt the food that they need. The food that they feed upon also has evolved to be in a certain temperature. When that changes quickly like that, there's no time left to evolve to the change. And what happens? What happens is organisms die and the living beings that depend on those organisms also die. It's an apt metaphor, perhaps, if I'm going to be gloomy, of what we can see happening quickly in our future. I'm going to turn it over to Paul, who will speak to some of the science in this report and let us know what we have before us. Thank you, um, Regina. I think that um, Michael Mann has retired from his hockey stick. I think uh, the person now carrying the hockey stick is uh, James Hansen, actually, because James is showing the world how everything's accelerating because of the reduction of sulfur in shipping fuels. And unfortunately, that's a big oversight of this um, report, this 53-page report, um, which was just published a week ago. So what does this report say? I'll talk about that. And I've already mentioned something that it doesn't say. So basically it's trying to sound the alarm on the rapid changes in weather extremes around the world and in the climate metrics or the climate indicators. 
So one of the climate indicators, as Regina's mentioned, is global average temperature. So for 2023, from January through December, end of December, we were 1.45 Celsius above the 1850 to 1900 baseline. If you do a sliding average and tack on January and February of this year, that pushes us well over 1.5. We're getting clusters of days that are over two degrees Celsius, and we're getting uh, whole months uh, the last few months over 1.7, and the oceans in the northern, the, the Atlantic has just gone crazy, the, the sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic. The report covers the greenhouse gases, of course, the main ones, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide. The rise in methane is about 17 parts per billion per year the last few years, which is horrifying. Nitrous oxide also set uh, new records higher than it's ever been, the rate of increase. I like the curves that it shows because not only does it show the greenhouse gases, it shows the rate of change of them. And you can clearly see how the rate of change is, is rapidly increasing. Another metric, of course, is it looks at Antarctic sea ice. It's dropped off a cliff the last few years. It looks at Arctic sea ice and, how, and the ramifications of that. Um, it looks at the temperature distribution, not just at the global temperature rise of 1.45, but how it's distributed across the planet. And of course, the poles are still warming like crazy. It looks at ocean acidification, how that's uh, still increasing. You know, so the pH is actually dropping and dropping and dropping as we get more and more CO2 absorbed into the ocean or picked up in rain and dropping as carbonic acid, acidifying the surface of the ocean. The ocean currents and salinity patterns are changing. Marine heat waves are hugely on the rise around the planet. We're having much fewer marine cold wave events. And global sea level rise is on a tear. So it looked at the last decade. The last uh, 12, 13, 14 years, the sea level has risen 4.77 millimeters per year on average. So this is a horrifying increase. Uh, you know, other, other numbers are more like three, three and a half millimeters per year. 4.77, it's setting new new records. The report looks at the effects of the El Nino. The El Nino wasn't enormous. It wasn't a super El Nino like in 1997-98 or 2015-2016. So the El Nino is adding a, an, is an effect, but it's not as big as people might want to claim. You can only account for, you know, maybe 20% of the rise that we're seeing from the El Nino. The rest is the, is the rapid accelerating climate change that we're seeing. The report Basically, you know, it looks at glaciers around the planet, glaciers that we've got records going back over 30 years for, in some cases much longer than that. And we're getting record melt rates of glaciers. In fact, there's some glaciers in Europe that lost uh, 10% of the remaining volume in the last uh, two years, which is just incredible. Also, uh, you know, we talk about the decline of sea ice, mostly in the northern hemisphere, now in the southern hemisphere, but snow cover is also very important. So the snow cover on the land in the northern hemisphere in the spring and early summer is very important for reflecting solar radiation away, and it's just not there. It's at record low levels, so we're getting lots of warming. And that warming effect in the Arctic is as large as that from the lack of sea ice. So it's a very comprehensive report. It's a very, very vital and important report. It's written in everyday language. And the authors do recommend that people put in their comments if they think the report's missing things or needs additional things. That information is also in the report. It's a must read, I would say. So, Paul, I just wanted to emphasize, you had said 4.77 millimeters, am I right? Yes, it's almost uh, five millimeters, which is a huge surge up in the rate of uh, sea level rise. Unbelievable. That is so frightening. That's amazing. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Peter, what did you get out of this report? Thank you, Regina, and, and thank you, Paul. So this was, a, uh, this was a big report. This is the World Meteorological Organization. And of course, they did highlight and headline the absolutely phenomenal 2023 global warming temperature increase. And it really is phenomenal. I mean, Gavin Smith, the uh, director of uh, NASA GISS, he wrote a little letter to a Nature Journal saying that um, it's beyond anything that the scientists can explain right now. 
He said it's beyond the models, way beyond the models. It's beyond the um, uh, reduction in aerosols, um, uh, and they're working on trying to explain it, supposedly. Um, I, I don't know about that, because um, I, sh I should start off by saying that um, they've got a new executive director, a lady. She's very, very good. She's Professor Sayolo. And so um, uh, she was introducing and, and explaining this report and very properly. She said that finally, and also Omar uh, Badoa, the um, uh, chief scientist monitoring, finally they said that global warming is accelerating, right? So it's not just James Hansen who says that global warming is accelerating. WMO is finally coming around to say that, so that's good. She also made the really, really good point that global warming is only one indicator, pointing out that there are all the other indicators and we really should be looking at all those together. So I was very happy to hear that because that's what I've been attempting to do for a number of years. And the most important indicators, which the report started off with, of course, are the atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations. In fact, the metric required for the 1992 climate convention is not global warming. It's uh, to keep the uh, concentrations of atmospheric greenhouse gases safe. Um, but we have never done that. Hopefully we will sometime because global warming is a pretty lousy single metric, right? You know, global average warming and it's going down here. <laughs> Having said that, though, I, I, I did notice that um, uh, global temperature has increased, uh, has doubled in the past 15, 16 years. I mean, that's huge, isn't it? That's absolutely huge. So 1.45, WMO took the average, but probably Copernicus would have been more accurate in 1.48 from Copernicus. So we really are at 1.5 degrees C. Back to the atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations, all three were record high. Atmospheric CO2 was record high. In the past few years, it slowed down a little bit, but this year, Every single couple of weeks, the rate of increase of atmospheric CO2 has gone up. So now um, that rate is double what it was 10, 15 years ago. And that is a dire, dire, dire emergency. We've, nobody has ever seen anything like this before. Never before. The rise of atmospheric CO2 two weeks by two weeks, months by month. Hopefully the scientists are going to get onto that because um, that is a dire, dire, dire emergency. The governments have to be woken up. Somebody has to wake the governments up, right? And the people to do that would be um, Gavin Smith and uh, the other climate scientists because we are headed, we're on an end of the world scenario. Every single one of these indicators is at record high again, but they're also increasing at record rates. So CO2 has now increased, um, the official numbers for 2023 has increased 50%. Methane, atmospheric methane has increased, they say 264%. So methane has increased by a factor of 2.6 plus. It was a second highest record last year. Nitrous oxide, was the number one highest. So last year, nitrous oxide, it increased more than any other year before. They did point out, and that was very good, they pointed out the uh, huge difference of, like I've said, of uh, this 2023 global warming. It was, uh, it was a huge 0.3% increase on last year. I mean, that's absolutely massive. But it was also 0.6 degrees C, above the last decade, the 1991 to 2020 decade, 0.6 degrees C higher. We are in gloomsday trouble. You know, I'm not allowed to say that word, but uh, we have the all the children today and all the future looking at a, a gloomsday. I'll finish by saying that uh, the IPCC AR6 pointed this out very well by saying that we had to secure a livable future. We're not doing anything. The governments and the corporations, complacency, I suppose, this new report this year, everything's way worse than last year. The governments have to be woken up.
Thank you, Peter. The governments indeed have to be woken up with the people. It seems like uh, it always falls on us to get them to do their jobs. I don't know. I don't want to say this, but it seems hard to to keep to keep hope alive because we keep producing more and more fossil fuels. The United States keeps, you know, year after year production seems to go up and up and up. It almost seems like with no wind in sight. So I, I'm very grateful for this report, of course, but sometimes I wonder what good will it do? What good will it do? We've seen so many marine heat waves over the years and in the last decade continually increasing. Uh, you would think that at least that the that big agriculture or big fishing would say, hey, you know, we're not catching as many fish. This is hurting our bottom line. But I don't know. Even that doesn't seem to do the trick. So, okay. uh, yeah, uh, Regina, th those were yeah inconvenient and painful truths, but the truths that everybody has to face. I mean, it's our duty, it's our responsibility to be responsible for this planet. There were some really um, big headlines on this report. For example, the combined loss of ice sheets, the combined loss of ice from Greenland and Antarctica last year were a record, a big, big record. Glacier melt in in the European um, glaciers and Alps, that's another record. Never, never melted as fast as it did last year. Sea level rise, I think Paul mentioned it, it's, it's doubled since 2000. I mean, these are massive, massive record-breaking, um, incredible data that, that we're getting. Ocean acidification um, is increasing at an accelerating rate. It's increased 30% since pre-industrial. Perhaps Paul would like to carry on in, in, in what he was uh, describing before. Yeah, so um, as Peter is saying, um, this is a very significant, I would say, landmark uh, report. I mean, you know, the WMO has been doing these uh, updates about this time of year for many, many years. The, the language that they're using in this uh, report that just came out a week or so ago is much more alarming, I guess, alarming language. It talks about, you know, this is the issue for humanity, that type of thing in the introduction from the, uh, you know, the UN people. Like they, they're kind of running out of words, you know, to say <laughs> things are really bad, wake up, right? You can only, I mean, you tell people that for long enough and you kind of get this gallows humor that, you know, nothing's ever gonna change. We're gonna see the worst of everything you know, and much sooner than, than people think. So I find it very difficult to understand or, or, or figure out why a lot of mainstream scientists that actually have large followings on social media, et cetera, are kind of saying, oh, you know, we're, we expect most of these things. Global warming's not, not accelerating, it's increasing at a steady rate. We predicted all of this with models. At this stage, that is complete and utter, utter nonsense for them to be saying that and acting that way, in my opinion. Yes, I totally agree with that. And an another thing that this report brought out and discussed, which is another topic that's near and dear to my heart, is what they refer to as IDPs, okay, internally displaced people. Uh, There's so many people who are being displaced because of these climate shocks, these climate stresses that they spoke to. And we don't even have to wait to see that. I mean, we can see it now. I can see it in my own country, the United States. I mean, we can't say that all of the people coming into the United States are climate refugees, but we can't say that it's not nothing. And so this is doing a lot to destabilize this country. You know, we don't have great choices for president coming up, but the fact that we have so many of these IDPs or these displaced people um, coming into the United States has done a lot to sway the elections. And this is not just happening in the United States. It's happening in countries all over the world when it's too hot, when there's not enough water, when people cannot grow food, they have to do something or else stay home and starve. And of course, when people have families, they're not going to stay home and starve. So we're just seeing a lot, a lot of geopolitical instability as well due to this. Yes, and the report actually has a nice uh, graph talking about the food uh, supply 
and food costs and food inflation, you know, and uh, also some of the other um, sustainable development goals, the UN sustainable development goals. Uh, you know, we were seeing big improvements in a lot of them from, you know, 1970, 80 to, the to a few decades ago. And it looks like a lot of the curves have turned. They're no longer falling. Uh, they're no longer improving. We're no longer getting closer to achieving these sustainable development goals, these SDGs, but we're going further away from where we need to be. And the report also looked a bit at climate finance. It showed how much money has been going into fighting, you know, climate change and, and issues. And uh, it's just a small fraction. I mean, there has been an increase in the last decade in that amount of funding, but it's only it's it's just scratching the surface. It's only a small fraction of what is estimated that we'll need, you know, moving forward. It's, it's like less than ten percent, I believe. So I like how the report actually then touches on some of these sociological factors, these human factors, as you mentioned, you know, population migration because of extreme weather events, you know, both within internally within countries, but also from country to country is becoming a huge issue. And like I tell people, you know, the idea of collapse it doesn't just happen. It's not like it doesn't happen in a day or a week. It's a death by a thousand cuts. You know, each country has a different resilience level. And the weakest, uh, poorest countries are really having difficulty to cope with what's going on even today. You know, and as time goes on and climate accelerates and more and more countries join that list and eventually it'll be the rich Western countries that are also there. I mean, we're seeing huge changes like with the insurance industry. People are losing the ability to insure their houses if they're on floodplains or in, you know, if they're places at risk of fire or and, uh, you know, it's the remote areas within countries, at least in Canada. You know, it's many people in the far north are really suffering from the higher food prices, they can't build ice roads. So the supply of food and the costs are much, much higher. So there's pockets within all countries that are being severely affected by, by the climate change that this report talks about and also by the um, sociological issues that the report talks about. So that's, that's really good that you brought that up. Well, there were a lot of stunning statements in this report. And the one that really stunned me was, uh, and I'm quoting here, the current global food and nutrition crisis is the largest in modern human history. My God. And, um, and as Paul indicated, the, the, the graph on that is getting worse. It's increasing all the time. So uh, we have changed from a situation in which hunger and malnutrition was going down for many, many, many years to that going up and now at record levels. Yes, they say that um, climate change and extreme weather events is a major contributor to that world situation. Yeah, I think the food issue is going to be uh, it's going to be how climate hits hits the world You're globally right. all over, you know, really hard. And it'll be the, the, the thing that finally maybe turns politicians around from their support of fossil fuels and further development and so on. You're absolutely right. It'll be the only thing. Thanks so much. And I and I want to also emphasize one of the things that you said for our audience. This report covers so much, but as as Paul said, it's very readable. Uh, it's highly accessible. There's a lot of science to it, but you're not going to drown in it. And we're going to include the link and we encourage you to read this report. It's got, you know, 53 pages, as we said, and you can read a few pages a day or just binge it and go through the whole thing. And what would be really great is if um, after you read it, you share some of the things that you found interesting in the report that we didn't have the time to talk about and share it with us in the comments, because we'd really like to see what it is that stood out to you. So please do that. And if you haven't subscribed yet, we really want to encourage you to do that. It's been so great to see those numbers go up. It's been wonderful to see our views go up. So please, please go ahead and click that subscribe button and be a part of the Climate Emergency Forum family. We'd love to welcome you into the fold. And until the next time, stay well and we'll see you later.